Good afternoon to the faculty and staff in the Radigan Student Center Beggs Ballroom and to the viewing audience on WSU-TV, Cox Cable Channel 13, and YouTube. I'm Lou Heldman, Vice President for Strategic Communications. A special welcome to the faculty and staff members who have joined the university in the past 12 months. Please, if you're new in the past 12 months, stand and be recognized. We want to thank the staffs of the following departments who have done much to make this event possible. The Radigan Student Center, the Media Resources Center, Sodexo Food Service, Student Involvement, Strategic Communications, WSU One Stop, and the President's Office. You'll find question pads under end seats of each row. If you have a question at any time, please raise your hand and someone will come collect it, or you can email it to president at wichita.edu. We'll get to as many as possible as time allows. When we adjourn here around 3 p.m., uh, please join us in the lobby for uh, snacks and conversation, and please visit the information tables you'll find there from student involvement in One Stop. Now, please welcome President John Bardo. Well, Lou, thank you very much, and, and thanks to all of you for being here and those who chose to watch on television. Uh, we uh, hope the reception is okay and that you get a good picture of what we're trying to do. This afternoon, I'm gonna talk to you about one issue. Uh, usually, I kind of go through a big update on all kinds of questions of what's going on on the campus, but today, I'm really gonna talk to you about one thing. Uh, this is the year that we really focus on the core of the university. Before we do, there's one, there's one thing happening on campus I want to make sure everybody knows about, and that is that today is Friday, um, and this is probably the last thing you really have to do today uh, before you can go have a real weekend. So uh, <laughs> I recognize that face, don't you? That's, that's, uh, that's real. We are, um, the one thing I wanted to make sure you knew is that next week we're starting a new student housing project on the Innovation Campus. It is likely to break ground on Thursday of next week. Uh, you're suddenly gonna see construction equipment in. And I just wanted to be sure that everybody knew that was happening, rather than just, oh, what's that thing going in there now? Uh, you'll also notice on 21st Street, there's a construction break now in the curbing. Uh, that's going to be the coffee house, which we understand should be open in January. So uh, everything is kind of moving along. But the apartment building, the developer pulled the trigger on it fairly quickly. Uh, they decided at the end of the day they were going to go ahead and do it. It will be about 285 beds uh, in the first phase. It will be real apartments, and it will be right on the Innovation Campus. So uh, it will, it, each student will have assigned parking, and if they want them, there will be uh, assigned parking in an underground garage under the building as well. So uh, it's a pretty cool place, but it's really aimed at upper-class students and at graduate students. Um, if there's freshman overflow, the building is designed so that we can uh, do a traditional RA kind of structure in it, uh, which we need to be able to do if we're going to offer services to freshmen. So we're not going to allow the freshmen to get hurt uh, by simply not having the right place for them. But uh, that's moving on. There is no university money in it, none. Uh, and so I, it's real important that you, that you know that. The relationship will actually be between the student and the developer, not with the university, but they will be... Uh, held to our same covenants that we have for all other all of the people who live on campus uh, Because it is private it is possible others other than students could live in it But they will also be subject to the code of student conduct Which at my age I certainly am not all that thrilled to be but you know if if, if that's your thing uh, It's uh, it may be it may be there, but there's certainly be preference for students and staff first um, <clears throat> So that's that's where we are What I want to talk today about is really our core mission. Uh, I'm not going to deviate from it. I'm not going to talk about anything else. And it is the focus of the year, period. Uh, we have to get this right. 
And we've been through now enough activity that we know where we're going, we know what needs to happen, and it's simply time to make it happen. It's just that time in the life of the university. We're starting from what the Kansas Board of Regents is asking of all universities. And this is the strategic goal, this slide shows the three strategic goals for the Kansas Board of Regents. Uh, we are obliged, because of being under their authority, to address those goals as best we can. And clearly, increasing educational attainment among Kansans is their number one issue. The state is not doing what it should be doing there yet. Second, the alignment between higher ed and the economy is absolutely crucial. I know for those of us that have been around higher ed a long time, we don't, we don't always like to hear that because we didn't grow up in an era where that was true. But over the last 30 years, and you can really trace the, 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 demarc the demarcator uh, to the signing of the Bayh-Dole Act in the early 80s, uh, once that act was signed, it was really clear that higher education had a different role. And higher education has moved from the edge where you sent your kids for four or five years so they could act out, uh, and then they could come into the real world, right? Because you didn't hold a student to being in the real world. They didn't have to do that. And, you know, I could wear a little tweed jacket and ride my bike and feel like I was doing something really cool. Well, you know what? Those days are gone, gone. And what the state is saying, what is being said all around the United States, and what is being said in all countries is that higher ed has to be at the center of prosperity and quality of life, and Kabor has said, we mean it. The third is excellence, excellence. Now, each of us have a definition of excellence rolling around in our heads. Most of it has to do with what I want to do as a person. I, I really like doing this, so I want to be really excellent at it, um, which would mean I'd be the best football watcher on Saturdays in the United States on, uh, uh, you know, in, in the falls. But, but that isn't really what we're talking about. Excellence is how well you achieve your mission. There is no one sense of excellence. And many of us who've been around higher ed a long time want to believe that there is one standard, and if you aren't aiming at that one standard, that you aren't excellent. And the fact is, if you think about it, Harvard's a really pretty crubby urban university. They don't do that well. On the other hand, we can do that better than most. And so achieving mission matters. Excellence is about achieving mission. Excellence isn't about one standard. A great baseball player may be a horrible quarterback. Doesn't mean the person isn't a great baseball player. And so the new tenure and promotion policy that our faculty senate passed and that we approved aims at creating a model of rewards that allows us and promotes our ability to be excellent. And so that is critical to where we're going. Our vision, pretty straightforward, fits with it. We simply want to be the outstanding model for applied education. Because look, let's think about this a second. You know, when I was in school, when many of you were in school, if you just could pass a test, right? On a Scantron, you bubble it in, life's good, man, you knew. I got an A, I'm good. Now, when I left the class, I didn't have a clue what that meant, but I could do it. So to know is, is, is good, I mean, it's not bad. But to know and to do, to be able to use it, that's an entirely different level of education, entirely different. And the third level of education, from my mind, and the one that really matters, is you not only know, you not only can do, but you know why. You understand why it matters. And so when we talk about being the outstanding model for applied education, what we're really talking about is that student who walks out of here and goes, I know how to do that. I know what it is I should do. I know how to do that. And by the way, I can apply it here and here and here, and it matters in my life, and it matters in my being a citizen, and it matters in my family. And that's what application is about. 
It's not just about bubbling in. It's not just about getting that A. It's about being able to take what you have learned and move it to the world beyond so that you have a better life, whatever contribution you want to make, you make. And at the end of the day, you have the advantages of being an educated person, which is to have meaning in your life. And that's what we're really about at the end. So that's why I love this model and why I think where we're heading is so absolutely crucial. Now we've got to get there. So how do we get there? Well, we have to think about culture. We have, uniformly, good people on this campus. I have seen very few people that I walk by and go, what is that person doing here? Oh, my goodness. What we don't have, however, is a culture and organization that is directed at the things that we care about. And culture is how an institution, any organization, gets things done. Culture is what you carry around in your head. Culture is how you make decisions every day. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't take out the rule book very often. I don't even think about the rule book. Instead, I try to think about what's right and wrong, and that's in my head, and that's shared with others, and I learned it from others, which makes it culture. And so what we really are going to focus on this year is how we shift the culture of the university from where it's been to where it needs to be. It's all about culture. So our culture today is focused on us. It's about who we are and what we want, and not really as much about what others need. And I say that with some trepidation, because I know that's not uniformly true. I know there are a lot of people out there who say, well, wait a minute, that's not what I do. I'm here at 7 in the morning, and I'm here at 10 at night, and students call me. But in the main, in the main, we are still internally defined by a culture that's all about us and not all about them. And the fact is, it can't be all about us. If it's all about us, we will wind down into nothingness. We've got to be about them. We've got to be about our mission. We've got to be about what the state is asking us to do. And that is about our students. It's about our community. It's about why we are here. So when you have a disconnect between culture and what you're trying to do, you kind of got a big problem sort of hard to get your enrollment moving across that gap. Kind of hard to get your students moving across that gap. I pray that that is a Photoshop. <laughs> Every time I see that picture, I go, oh my goodness, uh, I hope that was Photoshop. So, our, our culture in many ways is antithetical to what we're trying to achieve. And it's time to fix it. And by the way, I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not blaming myself, I'm not blaming you. We had a culture of stability. For over 20 years, we didn't try to grow. We were just fine, thank you very much. Well, you know what? That's a different culture than a culture of growth. It's a different culture than an externally focused culture trying to meet others' needs. Again, nothing wrong with it. It's not a bad culture. It's not an awful culture. Think about, I have a couple fast food restaurants I like. Um, if my wife doesn't choose, they're the ones I choose. I like Barnard's, and I like Freddy's. Don't eat either of them very often, uh, more than I should, but I like them both. I don't know if any of you go to those restaurants, and I'm not pitching them. Uh, I don't make any money off of this. But if you walk into Barnard's, granddad greets you at the, where'd you walk in? Grandma's behind the cash register. Son's running the, the back room. Uh, at least one wife of the son is there. Of the sons, I think there are more than one. Um, and last time I was in there, granddaughter handed me the sandwich. They only have one restaurant. One restaurant. And if you think about it, they're meeting their own goals. They're doing what they intend to do. They want to work together as a family and make a good living, and they are, with a good product that they could easily franchise. They could easily have 10 restaurants. But their culture is about having a family restaurant where we provide a really good product in one location where we can be together. 
Makes a lot of sense. Then you got Freddy's. Two brothers and a buddy decided to start a restaurant, and they decided they were going to franchise it nationally. And they're opening 30 to 40 Freddy's a year all over the United States. They're doing with their restaurant what they intended to do. They have a culture of growth. They have a culture of movement nationally. Now, do you think the folks at Barnard's would be really happy if we went to them and said, you've got to do the, Fre you've got to do the Freddy's culture? I, I don't think so. And do you think the people at Freddy's would be very excited if we said, whoa, 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 you need to be Barnard's? They wouldn't be very happy either. And if you think about it, there's nothing wrong with either culture. And they're both really good sets of people. And they care about their businesses, and they care about who they're working with. But they have very different cultures. And so what we're looking at is aligning our culture with the goals that we have in the same way as they have. And I, I use restaurants, by the way, because we all eat at them, and they're not us. And so it's real easy. To, it's much easier sometimes to see those than it is to see when we're talking about us. Uh, it's like when I go to the doctor and he tells me I need to do something, it's harder for me to accept than when he tells me my wife has to do something because what's well, not me. Yeah, yeah, she needs to do that, right? Very different. <laughs> okay. So we spent years focusing on stability, not growth. To achieve our mission and to achieve the, what they're asking of us at Kabor, we have to grow. We have to. There's no choice. So what do we need to do? We need to take the stairwell and move it over so that the students can get through the doors. That is probably the best stairwell ever designed by any engineer in the history of the world. And those are probably the most fantastic doors ever designed by door designers in the history of the world. And neither of them are gonna do very much because there's not alignment. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that stairwell, we're gonna dig that puppy up, and we're gonna slide it over so that our students can go through door one and get in the university, so that our students can go through door two and be retained at the university, so that our students can go through door three and have a great education and a wonderful experience, and then they will go through door four to graduate and contribute to our society. That's where we're going. Please keep this in mind, because this is the slide that defines it all. We are moving from the stairway, great design, but not connected to the goal. And we're gonna slide that over so that we do what we intend to do. Is that gonna be easy? No, it's heavy. We've got to dig. We've got to move some things around. But we'll do it. We can do it. We're going to be our culture. When you get in there and people go, well, what's Wichita State trying to do? You know, our, our normal. Here it is, straightforward elevator speech, student-centered, innovation-driven. And by innovation-driven, I'm not talking about patents, though that's part of it. I'm talking about doing better the things that we do. Innovation is about doing better the things that we do. So let's look at the culture. We need to think about the fundamental question, what do students actually need, not what do I wish they need? When I taught here, I fought for three years to get my favorite course in the curriculum. Sociology 634, the sociology of town planning. Finally got that sucker through the apartment, finally got it through the college, and I offered that course once. And every person in Wichita who needed that course took it the first time. I wish, I still wish, that every person in Wichita needed that course. Because that was a dang good course, and I loved teaching it. And so when we did a curriculum review when I was department chair, the very first course that I eliminated was my course. Because every person in Wichita who needed it had already had it. I wish that weren't true, 
but they really didn't need it. Okay? And so that's, we need to think about that. The second thing is, it's up to me. It really is up to me. It's not up to somebody else. It's up to me. If I don't fix it, it isn't going to get fixed. If you don't fix it, it isn't going to get fixed. So it's not about doing somebody else doing it. Oh, yeah, but I'm a groundskeeper. I just mowed the lawn. It's not up to me. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. You see someone walking around campus who looks a little lost? I'll bet as a groundkeeper you know where most things are. Ask them. Can I help you? Can I get you somewhere? Real simple. But that may be the difference between a kid staying on campus and being part of the university and not. There was a, there was a, a woman who maintained Neff Hall when I was here as a young faculty member uh, whose name was Mrs. Mullman. Mrs. Mullman befriended me and befriended my wife and my wife's best friend. And a lot of why I stayed at Wichita State wasn't because I had good friends in the department. It was because Mrs. Mullman decided that she liked me and would take care of me. And taking care of me simply meant walking into my office when I was there at night by myself and saying, well, Dr. Barter, how are you? Things going okay for you? And then she'd go mop the floor. She made a difference. It wasn't her job. She didn't have to do that, but she did. And I still remember her 43 years later because she made a difference. So, the us-centered, the us-centered culture. Have you heard this? Oh my goodness, there's a student in front of me. I don't know what to do with that student. If I send them all the way across campus, I'll never see them again and I'll be okay. All right? We all, bet. first of all, I've had that happen to me. And I know you've seen it and heard it. In a student center, you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me call the one stop and find out who can really help you. Real simple. But you don't send them away. You don't guess. You find out where they can get help. Advantage of being associated with the university for 43 years, and I know that's not true in almost every case. Always was since I came, when I, whoever I am, since I, the day I came, it's always been done that way, so it's always been that way. And in a student-centered organization, you say, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, we've done it this way, but it, the kid isn't getting what they need out of it. The student isn't getting what they need. Um, what if we did it this way? Well, that isn't easy. I've done it this way forever. Yeah. But the students, what about the student? Okay. How about, well, well that's not my job. No, won't do that, not my job. This is my job, I do this, I don't do that. Or couldn't it be, hey, what do you need? Let me help you. What do you need, let, what, let me help you. Helps that student move along to where they need to be. Helps your colleague get things done. As opposed to, I just don't feel like messing with it myself. So, yeah, well, no, not my job. Yeah, it is. Okay. This one also has driven me nuts since I came back. And we are killing rules as fast as we possibly can kill them. If I had a, we'd be gone for rules, we would be using it today. Oh, the rules say you have to do this. Okay. But does the rule actually matter? Did it really, if Moses had had three hands, would it have really been the 11th commandment? Probably not. We probably made it up. And the corollary of this is state law requires it. I like that one a lot, too. I just heard that one again today. Um, and the answer to that, if someone tells you that, is can you show me the law? Because I was told that a whole lot. And I went and looked at the state law, and it actually didn't require any of the things we said it did. So we have a lot more flexibility in our rules than we think we do. We made them, and we can change them. Okay, this is another one. You broke the rule, you must be punished. We aren't going to let you register because you broke the rule. Oh, you broke the rule, we're going to suspend you from school. Oh, you broke the rule, we're going to make you write an essay to prove that you knew you broke the rule and that you were an evil person. Instead, why don't we look at the question, does this rule even make sense? Is it something we should be enforcing? Does it help us achieve our mission? But even more importantly, 
what are we doing to the student? Are they actually benefiting? There are times we will punish people, absolutely. You commit a sexual assault, I will punish you as much as I possibly can. Whatever the law will allow, I will take it to the extreme, no question. But if it's one of our rules, and we made it up, why don't we take a look at it and say, is it really help the student to punish them? Or should we be thinking differently about how we manage that student so that they learn as opposed to feeling like they were hurt? We've got still way too much of that on the campus. Way too much. And I hear it, by the way, from alums, and I hear it from current students. OK. We are the Bureau of Red Tape. The very first department I am eliminating from this university is the Bureau of Red Tape. It's amazing. We have at least 19 chapters of rules. I'll bet you don't know them. I'll bet you haven't memorized them. I haven't. Um, we've got to be able to fix that. Now, there are federal regulations. There are laws. There are state regs. Yeah, of course. We'll deal with all those. But our internal rules, the question is, does it really advantage us in achieving our mission? Does it really protect the student? for real, and are we using it to really help that student learn? Because if that's not true, then we have to question why we have the rule at all. OK, this is another one I like. I am important. I don't have to work with you because I have control. I don't have to work with you at all. I'm in charge. Don't care what you need. It's called silo, the silo. We've all experienced it. We've all seen it. And I've even seen silos within silos, where people at two desks can't know what the other person does because that would be giving up power. Really interesting. We can get away from that and get to, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's work together on this. The other one I like a lot is my silo is more important than your silo. All right? If you get a new computer, I got to get two. If you get a new administrative assistant, I got to get a higher paid one. Because my silo is more important than your silo. That's how I know I'm important, because my silo is more important. And by the way, write in whatever you want on silo. At department, group, college, doesn't matter. You know what? If there are ways we can share resources, save a lot of money, improve service, and be able to put our money where we can help people. I'll bet nobody knows this except the people that work directly with me. The legal office, strategic communication, and my office eliminated three administrative assistant positions and moved those positions to admissions to get admissions counselors. Did any of you notice? I think actually we're more effective without the positions than we were with. So we're not eliminating jobs. We're simply moving them where they need to be. But I can tell you Lou isn't as important as he was because he doesn't have an administrative assistant sitting outside of his office. Now, by the way, she didn't have a lot to do, which is why she left the university, because she was getting really bored because he types all his own stuff. But we now have one administrative assistant handling both of our offices, and, and the attorney's office is down to one with three attorneys. So we can make these changes and put the, put the resources where they need to be, put those jobs where they can make a difference in people's lives. I like this one a lot. Yeah, I know, I want to help, but mm -mm, not my profit and loss. No, that's uh-uh, can't do that. We need to move away from that. I hear regularly from our staff, and I hear regularly from students that they know we're siloed. They know it, and we can break that down. We're, by the way, we're getting better, and I'm not, this is not a, we're getting a lot better, but there's a lot more to go. Okay, but I don't have, uh, whatever it is, assistant, control, et cetera, and that means I'm not as important. I have to have it, so, because that makes me important. What if we just simply say, look, I'm important if I actually do things that help people. Not how many people sit around me, uh, not whether you call me by my last name or first name or title, really important. And I don't care whether you're paid $20,000 a year or $280,000 a year. If you make it happen for them, you're very important. And if you don't make it happen for them, having a bunch of people sitting outside your office doesn't make you important. Okay, so 
I only teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, but the students want to come on Monday. Nope, nope. I only teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Huh. Wouldn't it be nice to offer the classes when the students actually want them? Wouldn't it be a value? So the students can graduate? So the students can get what they need? Um, I like this slide a lot. No, this isn't about you being important. It's about showing how important I am. Right. Okay. Oh, you know, yeah, I do that, but we just don't have any money. Don't have any money. Never have any money. So everything I'm doing right now is the absolutely most important possible thing that could be done. So you know what? Anything else going to happen? Got to have new money. Got to. No organization in the world operates that way. No organization. Your household doesn't operate that way. If you have to buy a new air conditioning unit, I can bet you, you rearrange your priorities. Right? Nobody operates that way. And yet we say that all the time. And that's simply an excuse. We can look at what we do. We can look at streamlining. We can look at what is not helping us as much as it could. And we can move things around. We can. And that's part of the new culture. Remember what we're really trying to do here? Sorry for the inconvenience, folks, but we're really trying to change the world here. We're trying to change the trajectory of Wichita. Think about this a second. Just think about this a second. What's our largest export out of Wichita? If we're going to ship something out of Wichita, what's our largest export? Somebody yell it out, because you all know. Sorry? Aircraft, right? Aircraft. Talent is number two. We export $150 million net a year in educated people out of Wichita. $1.5 billion every decade. $1.5 billion every decade. Oh my gosh. We need them here. I mean, I'm getting old. I, I can't keep this up forever. I want someone to replace me that knows more than I do. Right? We need our talent not to be leaving. We need them to be coming in. We need people not just to come here to go to college. We want them to stay here and raise their families and be part of our community. And so in real ways, folks, pardon the interruption, and we can tell the whole community this. Pardon the interruption, but yeah, we're not just moving some streets around over here. We're actually trying to change the world. We're actually trying to reverse that trend of talent leaving Wichita to talent going, why would you go anywhere else? Why would I want to live anywhere else? Oh my gosh, the quality of life here, the kind of people who are here, the things they do, the places we can go. Why would we want to be anywhere else? We're trying to change the world. Not all of it, but the 10 counties around Wichita, that's our home. And that's our responsibility. OK. The other one I like a lot, and I've heard this at every university at which I've worked, I am the only one with standards. Everybody else just passes students. That's why so many students fail my classes, because I'm the only one with standards. Heard that one? Yeah, makes me grit my teeth. Um, what about instead, hey, look, what I'm teaching is important material. And I know it's difficult for a lot of people. How do I create a pedagogy that allows them to successfully complete my class? If the university would just get smarter students. I'm a great teacher. The students are just too stupid to learn. Heard that one? I have, not only here, but at every university at which I've worked. And the truth is, at the end of the day, we're a public university in a populist state, which means we're going to have a wide variety of students. And if you know what? If there's no learning, there's no teaching. Don't know what's going on. You might be great at declaring. But if there's no learning, there's no teaching. And at the end of the day, you know what? If half your, half your class isn't doing well, you might want to look in the mirror and see what you can do, not to water the class down, but to maybe shift how you teach it so that normal, average people can learn. That's a really big deal. OK, so 
There's been a lot of change on this campus. We've got, we used to have a golf course. It doesn't exist anymore. As a, one of the members of the foundation board said when he came back down, he said, man, you put in a whole lot more sand traps since the last time I tried to pay that course. Uh, and I said, yeah, right now your handicap is your clubs, actually, not the, not the sand traps. We have shifted a lot in admissions. And I will tell you, they're feeling it. And I suspect they're not happy every day. Because we've asked a lot of them already. And we're going to ask a lot more. There are a few areas of the university that have undergone massive change. But most areas of the university are no different than they were 10 and 20 years ago. And we really haven't touched them yet. And so while it feels like there's a lot of change going on, the fact is most of us live our daily lives on this campus the same way we did five and 10 years ago. And so this is going to be the year where we get into that and really look at it carefully across the institution, especially as it relates to students and their achievement of their goals. So <clears throat> the other place, uh, the couple things I want to talk to you about and show you what can happen. I want to talk a minute about housing. Because those of you who have been around the campus know, we built this whacking big dormitory right in the middle of the campus, which was a big thing in itself. But I would think if you ask anyone who's working in the housing office how easy it's been to transition from where they were to where they are today, if you give them a glass of wine away from the university, they'll probably fill your ears uh, with some fairly unhappy experiences. That wasn't an easy transition. It wasn't. But look where we are today. The red line of the number of students we have moving into the residence hall this year as opposed to the last five years. We have more students than we have had in years. We have tripled the number of out-of-state students in residence halls. People want to be in housing. Our leadership in housing is working to advertise reasonably. They're working to create a culture within housing that really works. Now, has it been easy? No. Heavens, no. But look at the change, and that's just starting. That's just starting. The Honors College. We used to have programs that were aimed at recruiting really bright kids, but they were very expensive and very limited in the numbers. And we decided instead to go with an honors college. And there were a lot of people who were very upset about that, even made newspapers about how upset people were about that. And I got blessed out as recently as this summer uh, for having eliminated that old program. But you know what? The new program ties to academics. The new program ties to how students live their lives. The new program is about students achieving academically and socially. The new program is about undergraduate research and active learning. And there are linkages to all the colleges. And people are majoring in programs they want to be in and are still getting honors and are finding that useful for themselves. But look what's happened to the numbers. Under the old program, we had 200, 250 people. We opened the Honors College, we had 413. And as of last week, we have 551 honors students in that college. Now, this, this development from inside the college was a little different. This development was about people who were already on campus who wanted to do a good job who got excited and took it over and ran with it. And so while they had, I'm sure, sleepless nights and tough times getting it going, there wasn't the feeling of conflict and loss because they wanted to do it. They were ready to run with it. And so all these changes aren't necessarily hard, but many of them will be because it is a different culture. But this is another example of a program that's working. It's one of the few things that we've really spent a lot of time on, and you can really see the impact of it. So what has happened over the last year is that we have a really good set of people in place 
who know what they need to do. We need to help them move that culture along. We need to work with them. And we need to take responsibility ourselves. Last year, I asked a group to come together and to create a strategic enrollment management plan. That plan will be, in a, will be rolled out for the campus on the 29th of August. It has both short-term and long-term recommendations. And with a few exceptions, um, I'm accepting the recommendations. There's a couple of things I want to see tweaked, uh, but really other than that, it's a darn good plan. What is clear as you look at the plan is we have to have one leader for enrollment management. We've been doing it by committee. <laughs> I can't tell you how proud I am of the people who have taken this on and done this work. It's phenomenal work. But we've been doing it by committee. And that's hard on the committee. At the end of the day, it means they don't have the authority they need to get the things done quickly that they need to get done. But we also have to include in it advising, retention services, support services, and retention to degree. And those things have all been operating separately. We have a one-stop that has great capacity, but it has to be much more robust. It has to be much more robust and play a much more critical role in how we deal with students. And so we're going to be looking at where we move the one-stop and how we much better integrate all the resources we have, because right now, they're kind of spread out and they don't report to one person. We're going to be focusing on student transactions and their relationship with the university. What is it I experience as a student? What drives me nuts? We're going to be talking a lot this year and working a lot on differentiating course selection from advising. Course selection for most students who've declared a major can be automatic. You can actually populate a degree plan for that student showing what the student has had and hasn't had so that they can go ahead and click and go right through and get their courses. And if they don't have the prerequisites, it says you don't have the prerequisite, you need an advisor. Or sign up for the prerequisite and it's okay. We can also do push scheduling where we help, we look at, we, we use that software and create a tentative schedule for the student. So the student, so we tell the student, these are the things that will help you graduate now they can come back and say, oh, well, I don't want to do that, I want to do that, okay. But this is what will get you there the fastest. We can do that. There's a lot of things that we can do, we just simply have to make it happen and get our policies out of our way. Get our policies out of our way. So, um, <clears throat> we need to have a consistent policy on advising. One of the things that happened this summer is we saw a whole lot of things go on in advising that didn't work for us and made it really clear where we had to change some things if we were going to make it work. And the way you change it is to create a robust one-stop. That's a known solution. Works on campuses all over the United States. It doesn't take the, the core advising in the major away from the college, but what it says is there's a backstop to make sure this kid gets helped. Look, any time a kid has to wait seven to ten days to get, a, to get an advisor, what, what percentage do you think of those kids will not come back? Can't imagine going into a car dealership, much less important than getting a degree, much less important, but imagine going into a car dealership and having them say, oh, I'm sorry, we can't give you a salesman for 10 days. I don't know about you, but I'd buy a different car. Right? And so that's, we just can't keep doing those things. We've got to have a different model of how we advise, how we do course selection, how we help those students achieve their goals. That's what we're trying to work through this year. Has to be student-centered. I've asked Rick Muma to take responsibility for coordinating all of this. And Rick has agreed. And so Rick will be leading the team that will work with admissions to help them get the support they need. Uh, Bobby knows where a lot of the roadblocks are. I'm convinced of that. And what we are gonna do with Rick is ask Rick to run the traps to handle those issues so that we eliminate those roadblocks. We know where a lot of the issues are in terms of retention of students. Rick is going to be working on those issues. We are going to be working on questions of scheduling of classes, of do we have enough of the right classes at the right times. 
Those are all critical course, critical issues. We're going to be looking at, are the people teaching the crisis, you know, are they really doing what they need to be doing to help the student get where they're going to go? We know students, they're going to students who fail, they're going to students who drop out, we know that. But let's not magnify it. Let's, let's make it so that the students who want to do it, who have some ability to do it, that we can help them achieve. So we're, I'm also meeting with every dean and Tony to talk through what we see are the issues within each college, because um, they're unique. There's some that are common, but there's some that are unique to each college. Uh, to try to help those deans focus on, let's get this right this year. If we get this right this year, it'll make a difference. And so all of you who are in the colleges with your faculty or staff will be engaged in these conversations as we move forward through the year on how do we solve these issues because they really have to be solved. We're refocusing advising. We really are going to try by the end of this year, if, if we can figure out the money side of it, uh, which I think we can, we're going to try to figure out how we differentiate course selection from advising and how we really focus it on, on a satisfaction model. And I, I want to differentiate here, and I think this is really important. As a faculty member, I'm a professor, by the way, that just happens to be doing administration. I've never stopped being a professor. Uh, it's who I am. It's how I think of myself. When someone says to me, well, your student is your customer, drives me crazy. That's not true. The student's not my customer. Now, if the student goes into the Radigan Center and wants a sandwich, the student's a customer. But when the student's in my class, they're not a customer. They're a client. All of us go to the physician. All of us go to the physician. Now, if you walk into the doctor's office, I don't know about you, but I suspect he knows more about medicine than I do, which is why I go to him. I can't imagine walking into that doctor's office and saying, you know, <clears throat> I'm your customer. I want to be treated for goiter. And the doctor goes, we don't have a goiter. Yeah, but I'm the customer. And in my family, being treated for goiter is cool. So I want to be treated for goiter. What do you think that doctor's going to do? Probably call the paddy wagon. But the reality is you go to that doctor because they know more than you do. If I go to a lawyer, if I know more than the lawyer does, we're in trouble. Right? If I go to a tax consultant and they know less about taxes than I do, we're really in trouble. Right? You all are professionals. You know more than the students. They're your client. They're not your customer. They're your client. But you know, if I go to a doctor and I'm not satisfied, I go to a different doctor. So the client has a right to judge what you do but they don't have the right to tell you what's right because they don't know. If they knew, they wouldn't be your client. If they want a taco, you know what? They can have it their way, their customer. But when they're in your class, when they're working with you, they're a client, they have a right to judge what you do, they have a right to be satisfied, but at the end of the day, you're the expert. And it's really important to differentiate those two things. We're going to work on customer satisfaction. We're going to have a better food service options. We're going to have more activities. We're going to try to have some more exciting things going on so that students feel like they're being treated well. But we're also going to try to improve the client relationship so that they get what they need from us in terms of quality of education, quality of experience. OK. So what's this all about? It's about culture, not people. It's about shifting how we think. It's about setting our priorities and meeting our obligations to the people of Kansas. I used to work in North Carolina with a governor named Jim Hunt. And Jim Hunt, if you may know of him, he's quite well known nationally, 16 years as governor of North Carolina. And when they would have tough times, Jim Hunt would look at the, look at the TV monitor and he'd say, we're North Carolina, we can do better. And you know what, Jim Hunt was right. But I've been associated with this university now for, this is my 43rd fall associated with this university. I've known this university through thick and thin. We are Wichita State. 
we can do better. We have the people. We have the capacity. We have the drive. We can do better. Not you can do better, not I can do better. Together, we can do it right, and we can do better. It really is, at the end of the day, where we start. It's about student-centered, innovation-driven. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for paying attention with this long-winded old guy talking at you. But truly, I, am, I feel so blessed to be back at this university with the kind of people that we have here. Again, thank you. Have a great year. Dr. Bardo, I hope that uh, people who have questions will hold them up and they'll filter up to me. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the softball and then go right to the hardball questions. All right, perfect. Okay, so here's the softball. Uh, isn't every university student-centered? That's why we're here, right? You know, actually, um, we'd love to say that, but most universities aren't student-centered. The culture at most universities is about us, not them. Uh, and that's not unique to any one university. Um, at the end of the day, what, what makes successful universities really successful is they've been able to figure out how to keep it about them, because it has to be, look, if people aren't satisfied when they come to work, they're not going to come to work and, and do a good job. But at the end of the day, they find that way of making sure that the student's being paid attention to at a level they need. Uh, many people in this room haven't had a raise in a long time. Yeah. And now health, health insurance costs are going up. Right. What can we do? Well, I'll tell you, we're trying to figure it out. Um, I'm just going to be straight with you. There's no other way. I, I can't do anything different than that. The state of Kansas isn't going to fund us any better than we are today. So whatever we have today is likely to be the best we have going forward. Second, I think there's likely to be increasing rebellion among uh, the populace and therefore the legislature and therefore the regents uh, about tuition increases. And so the bottom line is if we're going to make any difference in people's salaries, if we're going to be able to help people with their income, we have to increase enrollment. It is the, it is, there are two things we control, enrollment and grants and contracts. We control those things. And that's where the money's going to come from. I'm really very concerned about uh, the increased health care costs, especially for our lower income people. I've put together a task force to see if there's anything we can make work. But until we know what our enrollment looks like, until we know how we can rearrange to get priorities, I can't give you a straight answer. Uh, but I can tell you that task force is starting work today, uh, and we're, we, started, we started last night uh, in exchange of emails. But we're going to try to see if there's something we can do, especially for our lower income people. Your plan for infrastructure improvements and new facilities has been very clear since your arrival. Is there a similar plan in place to recover the faculty and staff lines that have been cut? Yeah, um, yes and no. Again, the infrastructure part of it is pretty straightforward. We know how to do that very easily. But the faculty and staff lines that have been cut all relate to enrollment, all relate to budget. And so the answer is, yeah, all of this is about getting the resources that we need, allocating the resources in a way that's meaningful, and making sure that we do what's right. Now, does that mean that every position that's been cut is going to be replaced? 100% no. Guarantee that. 100% no. Um, I'm not replacing the three positions that have been cut out of my division. I'm not. There will be faculty positions that were in one department that are no longer, by the university's definition, needed in that department. The department probably will never agree to that. Uh, so the answer is no. We're never going to replace everybody, but we are going to try to get additional resources by growth to move us where we need to be. There are a couple of questions related to how uh, new building projects are being funded. Right. Uh, so uh, start with the uh, parking garage. Right, yeah, just yeah. south of here. Yeah, that one's kind of fun. Um, when, we, when we operate in our houses, um, unless you, at least in my household, I have one checkbook, um, and, I, and my wife controls it, um, uh, but I have one checkbook. 
Deborah's sitting right here is why I keep teasing. Um, but she does. And so if I need to pay a bill, I pay it out of that checkbook. That's not the way universities operate at all in the public sector. Universities in the public sector have what is called fund models. And you can't move money from one fund to another. There are certain things you can move around, but you can't just move money around at will. So the parking garage. I think I got a question uh, by email that said, how can you build a parking garage when you can't give us raises? Well, the parking garage comes from parking fees, and I'm not allowed to use parking fees for general raises because the state won't allow that. They're different funds. I could build 10 parking garages and never give a raise or not have money for a parking garage and give everybody 20%. There's no connection between the two, okay. no connection at all. Uh, so. Are we paying leases with student fees and other general funds, or are we using funds that, this is about an infrastructure question, or are we using funds that can only be used for infrastructure? I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, well, let's take uh, uh, something like the uh, infrastructure going up on Innovation Campus, oh, right. okay. the, the roads and pedestrian Right, walkway. now those aren't being paid by student fees. Actually, most of that infrastructure, if you look, there's a big sign that upsets some of our Republican friends because it said President Obama has funded this. Um, uh, there is uh, uh, money from the US EDA that is funding most of our infrastructure. Uh, there's money from the state and money from the federal government and money from the county and money from the city, specifically earmarked for that. We're not using student fees or tuition for that. Okay. Please speak to plans to help diversify our population of students, faculty, yeah, and this staff. Is a, I'm so glad that came up. This is a really big deal. Um, I have a diversity council I put together last fall that's now been working with me regularly. And um, I think the people on the diversity council uh, believe and understand that this is about action, not pretend. Uh, I know Marche Fleming Randall, who is my assistant for diversity, uh, was over in the College of Engineering uh, talking with the department chairs about ways of thinking differently about how you recruit a diverse faculty. Um, we've had some really good conversations with the people on the diversity council about how to do some things differently to recruit a more diverse student body. Uh, we are looking at our allocation of merit aid versus need-based aid, which will have some impact on diversity as well. Um, but we are very serious about this, and we're going to continue encouraging people to do the right thing by educating them on what it means and how to go about it most effectively. Um, but I have been thrilled with the level of work of the Diversity Council. We are preparing uh, a uh, report card on diversity for the campus that will be out this year. Uh, so we're not only going to try to fix it in terms of dealing with it, we're going to tell everybody what we're doing, and we're going to judge ourselves on how well we're doing. And that is being prepared by the Diversity Council, not by me. Uh, in fact, Robert Weems is the one heading it. If any of you know him, he's about as honest a human being as I've ever met in my life. So it will be straight. Here's a suggestion in the form of a question. Okay. Uh, what about having administrators teach once every two years to, to increase the faculty in good teaching, community contact, you know, and innovation? That sounds good, but I did that. And I can tell you that's not a particularly good idea. Um, I, when I was chancellor at Western Carolina, I chose to teach. One time I was going to do it every semester because I love being in the classroom. And I found that the pressures on you are such that there's no way for you to do it. Uh, the number of times you get called away to do the things you need to do. And so the question is, you want us in a classroom dealing with 30 people, do you want us out dealing with the legislature to try to keep them from cutting our budget? Personally, I think that's our job is the budget cutting side of it. Um, but uh, are there administrators that could do that? They are, are and some volunteer to do it now. But um, I know I don't think it's feasible for me. I doubt if it's feasible for Tony. Not because I don't want to. I love being, I love it. And if anyone wants somebody to guest lecture in your class, I'll, yeah, I, I'll fit it in the schedule and do it. But it's, it really is about can you make it happen and be fair to the student. Okay. How, uh, this is a broad question and you don't have that long to answer it. Oh. Uh, how, how do we determine what is it that students need? Well, you know, it's really interesting. I, I find sometimes if you just ask them, um, that kind of is helpful. Um, I also find that if you're in a professional field and the people in that professional field are telling you you're not doing a good job, you might want to hear why. Um, but also, look, each of us have the things we love. 
That's why I started off with that Sociology 634 class. Because I know every, every student at the university would have been better off had they known about urban planning. But the reality is that's not true. And so a lot of it has to do with matching our interests to, to hear the student and understand what the student's really telling us. Uh, and by the way, if, if the whole thing about, yeah, they'll think I'm a really good professor 20 years from now. Yeah, no. The literature shows that they don't like you when you're in class. They're not going to like you better 20 years from now. And they're not going to think that you help them 20 years from now. Um, and so the bottom line on all this stuff is uh, talk to them. Talk to the people who hire them. Look at the community. Where are we failing? Where are we falling down? And how can I link things? The other things you'll notice, by the way, if the students won't take your classes, pretty good chance you're not meeting their needs. Pretty good chance. I'm uh, going to make my way to the stage to close this Thank uh, you. while you answer this last question, which is simply, shocker football? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but not this year. Thank you all so much. Thank you for being here. It is a great day to be a shocker. <clears throat>